when then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not please ourselves. Now what it's talking about in the King James translation is talking about infirmities. Those that are weak, that are powerless, that are weak in the faith. Those that are strong, those that are Christians that have been serving God for so long, that are strong in the faith, that are strong in the relationships with Jesus. It's saying that to help those that are weak and not to please ourselves. That means looking out for others rather than for yourself. That means putting others first rather than putting yourself first. Why? Because most of us that have been serving God for, for many years or for a, a while now, we're, we're, we're pretty much well planted in. And even though we're, we may be kind of going through some stuff today, or even though you know, we're going through a lot of things that are very good for us today, it's up to us on what we're going to do going to the next phase in our lives and our Christianity. Because in our lives, there's always going to be that one person or that one couple, that one family that is needing that faith that they are lacking, and they're not knowing on how to grasp it. You know, while all of us are sitting, sitting good and we, we, we're, we're fighting through our faith and we're fighting through our purpose, and then there's those that are just kind of like barely hanging on, just waiting for that one decision to be made. And it's getting out of our ways and out of ourselves and putting them first so that we can serve Christ with them. Because in a church and in, in a ministry, there's many others that are kind of like struggling. Not everyone's in the same place. Not everyone's in the same boat. Not everyone has the same relationship with Jesus as the person that is sitting next to you or in front of you. Everyone has a personal relationship with Jesus in different ways. Some are just barely getting to know Jesus. Some are just implanted in Jesus. And some are just not knowing even where to start. And it's up to us that have been saved for a while to look out for those that, are quest that have all these questions in their minds. They have all, all these questions within their hearts. Well, where do I start? How do I start? All these questions. And so sometimes we look at it as far as, you know, it's an interruption to our own lifestyles. It's an interruption to our own lives. We don't have the time. We don't have the day to help anyone else but ourselves. But we should be able to turn our hearts and look to them and say, you know what? Somewhere along the line, someone helped us out, amen? We didn't do it all on our own. Someone was there that was picking us up to church, to go to church. Someone was there telling us the word, whispering it in our ear. Someone was there consistently trying to bring us into correction with God's word and point us in the right direction. There has always been someone there for us. Even today, in, in, our, in, our, in our age, as we're maturing, we still have someone there today that consistently turns us back and puts us back in the rightful place. Why? Because what pleases them is seeing people turn and continue to grow rather than putting themselves first. Amen. Verse 2, it goes on to say, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Now, when we're talking about pleasing, we're talking about a seek to please or gratify to accommodate oneself to. To please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. To help someone grow. To edify them, to, to lift them up. Verse 3 goes on to say, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Reproaching is talking about to revile, to criticize in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of, me, of those who reproached you fell on me. We get insulted. How many of you get insulted from day to day? How many of you get insulted like you can't get away from it? It just, it just happens to you every single day. See, when, when, we have, when we have this thing going on called Christianity, right? When we have this thing going on that we have a relationship with Jesus, there's always something that comes against us. Whether it's our spouse whether it's our friends, whether it's our family, whether it's coworkers, whether it's uh, associates at work, 
there's always something that's coming against you because of your personal relationship with Jesus. See, this is where we have to look at it and begin to see, well, are they coming at me because of my attitude? Are they coming at me because I'm always grumpy? Are they coming at me because I think I'm always right? Well, then that's something else that's different. But see, if you're at work or you're around and you're professing in the name of Jesus, and now they're coming against you, now they're talking about your relationship with Jesus, now they're talking about your calling on, from Jesus, now they're talking about your purpose that God has given you, now they're coming against you. Now they're talking down on you. And sometimes we have to be careful on how we speak to one another. Because at times, we don't know, we may be raining on someone else's relationship with Jesus. We may be look, giving them the looks, we may be saying comments, thinking that we're doing good, but yet, you know, we're, we're tearing them down. And our words have powerful meanings. But yet, if we're doing the right things, remember that they persecuted Jesus first before you and I. And that things, these things will come, and they will come to us, and they will try to pull us down. But we have to remember that the love of God will continue to sustain us no matter what. Even during the times that we want to call it quits, even at the times when we're like at the edge and we're just like, we're ready to jump off, God's love will come in and contain you, and it will sustain you, and then it will build you up, and then it will pull you back in. And will continue to love on you and grow on you. Verse 4 goes on to say, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of peace, patience, and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. First Corinthians. First Corinthians 13, 13. It says, And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of this, these is love. And the importance of it is letting these influence the way we live. With all help, with us remaining in one heart and one mind, letting this remain in us in all times. Because not in all times we want to love, right? Not in all times we want to, we want to understand. Not in all times we want to have faith. Not in all times we want to have hope. But it says that of all these things, let love is the greatest thing. Because love is the hardest thing to understand. Love is the most challenging thing to do. How can you love someone that doesn't love you back? How can you say you love someone if you don't know what love truly is? And this is the most important thing because our love is way different from God's love. Our love towards our kids may be, may be different from how someone else loves their kids. But see, when it's God's love, it teaches us, teaches us on how to love each other. And I'm talking about how to love them the right way. Because our love is circumstantial. Our love goes according to the day that we're having. Our love goes according to where we're at in our relationship with God. But see, when we understand God's love, His love is always giving. His love is always loving no matter what the circumstance is. One of the things that we find in our Christianity and our walks with God, is sometimes we find ourselves having a grudge or an anger towards someone. But yet, we don't know the reason why. We don't know the reason why. You look at someone, all of a sudden, you get, you get choro, right? <laughs> right. Your, your stomach gets all upset. You're kind of like, oh, that person just irks me, man. I just, every time I look at him, I just want to smack him. Every time I look at him, I just want to pick something up and throw it at him. We find reasons to dislike someone, but yet we don't know the root cause of it. We don't know why. Because our definition of love, of God's love, has left us. 
And now we're loving someone else based off of, of our feelings, of how we see them, of how we look at them. And we have to understand that no matter what takes place, that we got to continue to love others no matter what to help them, to encourage them, to help them grow. Because, I, like some of you know, some of you don't know, I have associates at work. I have, out of four, three supervisors, four supervisors up there, there's over 100 markers. And so you have different attitudes. I'm talking about attitudes. I'm not holding back. You have different attitudes, okay? Everyone wakes up differently. Everyone has a different, a different character. They're good one day, the next day they're talking about you. You treat them good for three days, and that one day when you ask them to wait, they're spreading rumors about you. you, you and no matter what, when they come back to you and, they, and you know that they're talking about you, it's having to forget about that and still helping them. In their, in their performance and still helping them with the questions that they may have and still helping them not looking at the things that they're causing, the headaches that they are giving you, but looking at the need of what they're needing for that day. It's in the same thing. It, it, it may not be love, but it's understanding, hey, they have needs. Hey, they have differences. Hey, they're not going to act like how I act. Hey, they, everyone wakes up differently. Everyone has good days. Everyone has bad days. But understanding that there is a need, no matter what it is, they have a need, they have a question, and always to give the best answer, always to help them to resolve the problem that, that they may have, no matter what was spoken against you. See, this is the type of heart that we should carry. This is the way that we should carry ourselves. And then we bring this to church. We bring this into the ministries, into the churches. And then the churches begin to come clickish. I'll hang out with you, but I won't hang out with them. Why? Why won't you hang out with that brother? I don't know the way he chews his gum. It annoys me. We find the silliest things to look at. Oh, he chews out really loud. I don't want to have dinner around him. He gets on my nerves. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't, yeah. I chew loud. <laughs> and my daughter gets after me for chewing loud. So I do it on purpose. But the thing is, we look for the silliest things. But we don't look at what they have a need in their lives. We miss the big picture. We miss that, hey, they may be going through something. They may be struggling with something. But yeah, we're looking on the, on the outward. We're looking at what, what they look like on their appearance. They come, some people come in and, and, and they had a rough day or a rough night. Maybe they were crying all night. Maybe they were up all night. They come in with bags under their eyes. Their eyes come in all red. They're not saying a word. They're not, they're not telling anyone anything. They're giving it to God. But yeah, sometimes there's some people in church saying, oh, there goes brother so-and-so again crying all night like always. And we begin to have some type of animosity, some type of hate towards them. Why? Why is that? Have we missed on how God's love is? And are we loving people through our own eyes? Are we, are, are we an emotional love? If I'm doing good, everyone's doing good. If I'm doing bad, well, heck, everyone's going to suffer, right? Everyone's going to suffer because I'm suffering, because I'm going through it. In verse 7, it says, therefore, one, receive one another. Receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. That means welcome and receive another genuinely. That means without holding back. That means without putting on circumstantial rules. As long as you're happy, as long as you're up and beat, I will be your friend. But welcoming each and every single person and being able to talk to them and speak to them and, and, and help them out. Galatians. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. It 
It says there is, verse 28 says, there is neither nor Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor, or, nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are one in Christ Jesus. That means there is no differences. There is no way of your background. There is no way of how you look. There is no way of anything. And in the same way, this is how we should be looking at each other. And I'm not talking just about here. I'm talking about all around. This is how we should see people. We should see people this way. Because I could tell you one thing that if you have, if you ever taken the time, I know someone had talked about this before. I think it was Pastor Seto. You know, you see, you see people that are on the streets, and they're trying to get money somehow, some way. And but sometimes we look at them like, oh, it's their decision, and this and that, and we leave it as that. And sometimes we look at them indifferently. But just like the other day, this guy he came riding his bike. I was, all, I, was, I was here at the church during the week, and he just sat there. He was homeless, you could tell. And he just sat there, and we had a good conversation. He was happy. He was laughing, and he was joking around. I mean, he had a, he was, he had a good heart. But if I was just to look at him and then turn my head the other way, I would have never known who this person was. If he would have walked up to me and said, hey, do you have something? and turned around and ignored him, I would have thought, hey, he just wanted money. Or he just wanted something. He, just, he was just being needy. And all in all, he just wanted a, a wrench, an Allen wrench that I didn't have. He just needed some help with his bicycle. Because sometimes our mentalities are twisted. They're different. So therefore, we miss opportunities in conversation that could be someone just off the street that could inspire you in your relationship with God. Being more grateful for the things that we have. Being grateful for what surrounds us. And so we sat there and we talked for a minute. And then he says, all right, I'll see you later. I was like, man, I had a good time talking. So I continued to do what I was doing. He came back around. We talked a little bit more. Invited him out. He didn't come, but oh well, he, he knows that there's always a place for him to come. See, this is the way that we should be. Well, they have holes in their shoes. I had holes in my shoes before. Heck, I don't know if I have holes in my socks right now. But if you knew that, would you still invite me to church? If I was, if I wasn't, if I was all imperfect, which I know I am, would you still invite me to church? If you see me at a bar last night, but I wasn't drinking, would you still invite me to the church? Or would you have a false interpretation of who I really was? See, we don't know the background to many people. We don't know the stories to their background. And this is why as Christians and in Christianity, we must seek their hearts. We must know their hearts so that we know their struggles so that we know their background, so that we know on how to help build them up, so that God can get the glory. And to receive one another this way. This means not to identify how we see people physically, but to acknowledge that everyone, everyone belongs to God. Everyone. Every person that you see that has flesh that is human, they all belong to God. And it's not right for us to hold back who receives and who doesn't. Verse 8, it says, And now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promise made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. For his mercy, as it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And sing to your name in Acts. Acts chapter 10, verse 45 through 46.
And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. They were astonished as many as came with Peter because of the gift the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they had heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And going back to what the verses were saying in 8 and 9, that Jesus Christ had become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and to the Gentiles. So to those that thought they knew the law, to those that they thought they, they had the religion down to the very T, coming and speaking to them so that they can be set free, but not only just focusing on them, but also speaking to the Gentiles. See, the thing is, even though they may have thought that they were better off, even though they thought they were in a good place, Jesus still spent that time to give them the time that they needed so that they can repent and grow and change. He didn't say, you know what, they, they think they have it all. I'm just going to leave them where they're at and go to those that are really needing it, that are seeking it and desiring it, but have not had the time or the ability to come and get it. See, Jesus was talking to each and every single one of them, to the religious leaders, to those that they thought were nothing. Christ came to serve those that thought they were better than others. So God's promise could be revealed and to those that never had opportunity. See, he didn't choose sides. Jesus did not choose sides. He kept his purpose intact. It always stood intact, no matter what. Even though the Pharisees would try to come against him, he knew that they needed salvation. He didn't restrict them from ever coming around. And even though they try to come against him, and even though they try to slander him and slander his name, he did not tell the disciples to keep them away. He allowed them to witness the miracles. He allowed them to witness the changes in the people. Why? Because Jesus knew that they needed it as much as anyone else. And sometimes we can close ourselves off to others. We can close ourselves off to, other, uh, to others. Because maybe we think we've given them too much time. Or, they think, or we think that they had enough time. And then we close ourselves out. And we push them away. See, Jesus didn't do this. He kept putting in and he kept putting in. And he kept trying to lead and he kept leading. And he kept speaking. And he kept ministering to those that wouldn't want to listen and that did listen. Verse 10 says, and again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him the Gentiles shall hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Going on verse 14, it says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to do, able also to admonish one another. Able to admonish one another. Turn to First Peter, one twelve. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, the things angels desire to look into. See, this is, this is what we're talking about this morning. Here he is talking to the people, saying that he admonished, as long as we have these things, let us continue to, to give to those, right? Able to admonish. Verse 15, it says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. 
But before this, he was acknowledging as much as how much goodness that they had with them, on how much they were growing. But he's saying in verse 15, but nevertheless, this is why I'm coming to you more boldly. This is why I'm coming to you even more to your face. This is what he's saying this morning. I'm coming to you even more boldly with greater confidence and freedom. As reminding you because of the grace of God given to me, verse 16, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ, the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. But verse 15 is something that, that was needed. And that's always needed for us. We need this. Because he says, nevertheless, I have written more boldly to you on some points as of reminding you. As of reminding you because of the grace of God given to him. Because sometimes we need to be reminded of a lot of things. We need to be reminded. We need to be told again and again and again. Why? Because if you hear a message of faith one, one day and then two weeks again, you're hearing the message of faith again, sometimes you need to hear it again and again and again. And, and, and sometimes we come to church, well, why do we keep hearing about faith? It's because you need to hear about it. Why? Because when the enemy comes in and he comes and tries to destroy your relationship with God, if he tries to come in and tries to destroy your marriage, if he tries to come in and tries to destroy your relationship with the brothers and sisters, you need to know and you need to be reminded what faith really is. How many of you grew up and you were told not to get cookies out of the cookie jar? How many of you listened the first time? Yeah. The second time. The third time. How many of you never learned your lesson? Right? Yeah, exactly. This is why we consistently keep on the word of God. This is why we consistently talk about faith. This is why we consistently talk about love. Why? Because you're not going to understand it the first 20 times. You probably will not understand it the first 100 times. But eventually, time and time and time and time again, you will gain the understanding more and more and more. So that when you go through which, you're going to know on what place to fall on. Am I going to fall flat on my face? Or am I going to fall on the things of God? Because sometimes we can be in a split second from making a wrong decision. We can make a decision that could impact our whole salvation. We could be at the edge of making a decision to where we just, you know what, we just want to call it quits. But how quickly God reminds us of his love. How God quicks, quickly reminds us of the day that he has given us salvation. How quickly God reminds, of, reminds us of how many times he has forgiven us. How often God reminds, of, reminds us of how good he really is to us. That saves us from making those decisions. So yeah, there are times and times and times again that we have to be told again and again and again. Because someone may be needing to hear it, but guess what? They're just sitting there saying, I don't need to hear it. Yeah, you do need to hear it. You're just refusing to hear it, and I'm going to keep preaching it until you actually get it. I'm just as hard-headed as you. Just because you're from the world doesn't mean that you're harder than me then you don't know that side of me. And you don't know that side of my wife. <laughs> oh, well, some of you do, okay? But hey, when it comes to push and shove, God is going to come first. When it comes to push and shove, no matter what's going on, you're going to receive the word of God. No matter what, if you don't want to hear it and not hear it, if God is bothering us, guess what? You're going to hear it. And if you don't like it, well, I'm sorry. Go talk to God, because God has my back. God has her back. Why? Because some of the times that we have to speak, some of the things that we have to talk about is not easy. It steps on toes. It smacks some people around, spiritually. Heck, even speaking it, 
We get decisions as we get to them. Because I tell you, I used to just react on the get-go. That's it. This is my decision. I'm going to do it. If I'm not going to do this, I'm going to do this. If I'm going to stop serving God, I'm going to stop serving God. It was like this. But what is there to go to? What, what is there to look forward to? There's nothing in life looking forward to. We always could paint a pretty picture on the other side. We always can say the grass is greener on the other side. But I'm telling you, that grass is spray, paint, spray painted green with a bunch of thorns and thistles. And all we do is just hurt ourselves in the process. And we drag others along with us. Verse 16, it says, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, it says, Therefore I have reason to glory, to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. Meaning I'm not going to try to convince them of the things that have never happened in my life. I'm not going to try to make believe that God did something for me when he didn't just to try to make someone else believe in Jesus. I'm not going to do that. This is exactly what he's talking about. I'm not going to, I'm not going to testify and say that God's done something in my life if it's not evident. I'm not going to testify and say I've been delivered from drugs if on the weekend I'm snorting something. I'm not going to be a testimony. I'm not going to say something that I have not been delivered from, but I'm going to speak on something that God's working on me through. Why? Because when people see the end of it, guess what? Guess what? Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't him. I seen him struggling through the process. That was all God. God helped him. God helped her. In verse 19, it says, In mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. See, that's the one powerful thing about when it comes to speaking on the word, when it comes to preaching, when it comes to testifying, when it comes to talking about your testimony. We can talk about something that we're make-believing. Let's just talk about this, okay, this morning. We could talk about something that we're just making up. Why? Because we want to impress somebody. And we want to say how powerful God is because we love God. And we want people to get saved. We want people to come to repentance. But here we are. We're talking about things that God hasn't even done in our lives. Hasn't done nothing. But we're just kind of make-believing and we're, and we're, like, and we're doing the show. All we need is the spotlights, you know, and start flashing on us and, and, the, and, the, and the glitter ball, right? To give all the, the effects and all that. Oh, that's all we need because we're, bo- we're doing our best performance and we're telling people about God and, and what he's done in our lives, but it, it's totally false. So at the end of that conversation, you have nothing to lean on. You have nothing to remember. You have nothing to fall on. Now, when you start talking about God and you start witnessing to people and you start testifying what God has done in your life, and he started remembering all the things that God has done and he's doing and he's still doing today. And you're able to bring in, you're able to talk about people to Jesus. And in the same time, you're having a remembrance of what God has actually truthfully done in your life. And in this time, the fire, the Holy Spirit begins to burn more and more and more. And he keeps sharing. And then you're looking for the next person to share. And you're looking for the next person to share. And by the time that day is over with, guess what? You're inspired. Why? Because everything that you were talking about that day was true. It was real. So therefore, God brought into remembrance the things that he has done in your life. And now you're giving God more glory and being more thankful for everything that he's done in your life. And this is why in all things we should glorify God and the things that he has done for us and within us. Why? Because then we begin to remember. Why? Because then the Holy Spirit begins to stir you up. 
and it keeps you going. That's your motivation. That's the Holy Spirit just saying, you know what? Keep going, keep going. I'm giving you what you need. I'm sending you to whoever I need to send you. I'm giving you the energy. I'm giving you the strength. I'm giving you the courage. And we're no longer trying to do it on our own. But when we try to do it on our own, man, it does not work. We complain about the day. We complain on how hot it was. We complain about, man, I wish the food was better. We complain about everything. Now. Oh, and so-and-so wasn't doing nothing, and so-and-so wasn't doing nothing, and so-and-so wasn't. We start bickering and complaining about everyone else and everything else. See, when we do God's work, it builds us up. Have you ever felt that before? It builds you up, right? You get happy. You're like, man, I feel good. So when it comes to the kingdom of God, you can't fake the funk, right? Or you get funky <laughs> and you smell. But you can't fake the funk. When you're out there and you're, and, and, and you're doing the work of God, you feel that excitement, right? You're like, man, I can't wait for the next one. I can't. I want to do the next one. I want to do more. Yeah, that's because the Spirit's driving you. But everything else, if it's not going up, then it's about coming back to that place and saying, Lord, where am I at? Help me to acknowledge who I am in you. In verse 20, 20 and 21, and this is going to be in closing. It says, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as, as, as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. Not where Christ was named. Going somewhere and doing a work where maybe Jesus was never preached. Jesus was never heard of. Building a church, building a ministry from the ground up. Unless building on another man's and carrying on that work and carrying on that work. I know that when we have to make decisions as being leaders, and I'm talking about in the homes, it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be easy to make decisions in the home. Why? Because there's difference of opinions. There's different thoughts, different answers, different everything. But when we're building our households, we need to build them on God and be consistent with it. Because sometimes, I'll tell you what, consistency is the hardest thing. Amen? I'll be the first to admit being consistent is the hardest thing to do. And when it comes to building the house of God in your own home, that's one of the hardest things to do. Because our home is where our comfort is at. Our home is where our Netflix and chill is at. Our home is where our Disney Plus is at. Our home is where our couch potatoes are at. Where we could eat, snack, eat licorice all day long, watch TV and drink soda. And to be consistent in this is the hardest thing to do. But this is one of the most important things to do. Because as men, speaking to the men this morning and to myself, we must remain accountable to what we do for our kids and our family. And I'm talking about building that structure on God's structure, on God as being the foundation of that household. I say it because, hey, I got to do it too. Do I want to be consistent all the time? I sure do. Am I consistent? I'll be the first one to tell you I'm not. But I pray that God keeps me consistent in that area because it's not the easiest to do at times. I'm not perfect. But I'm not going to tell you to be perfect if I'm not. Same thing for the ladies. You know, just because the husband is, is needing to set that structure, ladies, you got as much say so as too, as they do too. You got as much authority as God has given you to pour into the children. 
to pour into your husbands to help lay that foundation too as well. Because sometimes if the man don't step up, the lady's got to step up too. Amen? Been there. Done that. But it's about edifying each other. And it's about looking at one another. And it's about saying, you know what, let's do this as a, together as a family, as a ministry. As we're all trying to build our own little structures, we have to remember that as we come to this place, that there's only one structure. And that we're all coming together and building on that with one spirit, one mind, and in one accord. Knowing that there's only one Father, amen, and he gives all the rules and he gives all the guidance that we need to follow. And then we have the leadership of the church that has all the accountability, all the weight and all the pressures of the one who made us to make sure that everything is going good. And then we have the structure, which is every single person that is here. Every single person has a place in God's church. God's going to use you. And there's some that are just wanting to be used. Like God used me, God used me. Yeah, he will when it's time. When you're ready to be used, God will use you. God will use you. But at the same time, let us always remember to take those opportunities to love one another, to speak to one another, to encourage one another. Even today as we walk by each other, tell someone that you're going to pray for them and that you love them. But let it be genuinely and not because you're being heard or you're being watched. Don't go up to someone and be like, hey, I love you, man. You see me? I'm I'm saying it. I love you. (laughs) Not that. That's circumstantial. That's because you're being watched. Love someone today, man. Father, we just.